from 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Rhode Island is sitting on $1.1 billion in federal money from the American Rescue Plan Act, and Governor Dan McKee is expressing frustration that not a dime has been spent yet. He's urging lawmakers to invest a chunk of the federal relief cash into Rhode Island's small businesses and is still hoping the General Assembly will meet this fall to hash it out. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, and here to talk to us about that and much more is Senate Finance Chairman Ryan Pearson, Chairman, good to see you. Thanks so much for having me. Let's uh, start with that, the American Rescue Plan money, or ARPA, $1.1 billion, as I said there. This, uh, that state money, I should say, does not include the money going to cities and, and towns, so it's yeah. just state money. Uh, Governor McKee wrote an op-ed in the journal complaining, again, that not a dime has been spent. He was asked this week what he's done to make that happen, and this was his answer. Let's take a listen. You're assuming that there's been no conversations or no effort to actually make this happen. Those efforts were going on very, very, very di diligently, and m multiple meetings were going on with Commerce, with the General Assembly over the last several months. Uh, and, and the anticipation, because, I mean, it's not a secret that it was said that there were, might have been a, a, a General Assembly session in the fall. We don't know whether that's going to happen or not, but we were relying on that as a possibility. Relying on that as a possibility, talking about the fall session. In other words, Chairman, it seems he's saying the holdup is with the General Assembly. Yeah, I think the important context uh, to start off with is Rhode Island has seen an unprecedented amount of federal money uh, coming into the state. And so if you think about the pot of money the governor's talking about that comes from uh, the American Rescue Plan dollars. Uh, the total amount of those ARP dollars is about 2.6 billion. Uh, the pot of money that the governor is referring to is about 1.2 billion of that, uh, which means 1.4 billion of it has already been appropriated by the General Assembly. You mentioned some to cities and towns, about a little over 500 million of it went to cities, towns, school districts. Um, and a, about the remaining portion of that went to the Department of Education, the Department of Health, uh, and many other departments and agencies all across state government. Um, and so there is plenty of money out there right now. Um, but that being said, the governor is accurate. We, there have been conversations behind the scenes uh, where the administration has shared that they would like to bring a proposal, uh, that they would like to identify additional areas uh, for expenditure. And we are ready, willing, and able to uh, receive that request. Um, on multiple times, both myself, the Senate President, uh, and I know my colleagues in the House have asked for uh, a supplemental request, a budget request from the bu from the governor, which is the normal process to be used, um, and we're we're ready uh, to receive that request whenever the governor is. So you're wait waiting for the governor's office to submit a proposal, but is there anything precluding? lawmakers with, with doing something and coming up with their own yeah. idea? So we're very intentionally beginning to move uh, not waiting for that request. If that request comes in, we will hear it when it comes in. Uh, but if it doesn't, we had the Senate Finance Committee uh, just a week or so ago had a hearing to really outline uh, now that all the rules and the guidance are there, we've fully digested it. We understand the parameters of what the money can and can't be used for. Uh, we had that hearing and we also got an overview of all the pots of money. So starting on Wednesday, we're going to begin reviewing. I mentioned we had $1.4 billion uh, that was already appropriated. We're going to begin department hearings on Wednesday uh, with the Department of Education, actually, uh, on the pot of money that they've received, uh, what have they already spent of that money, uh, and what are their plans to do with the remaining part of that money. Um, and we're going to continue doing that through all the departments and agencies, and then do a period where we're going to actually hear from ideas, whether it be the Rhode Island Foundation or other interest groups around what their plans are for the money that we have not yet appropriated. There, it is, there's been so much focus on the governor versus the assembly about how to spend that pot, but it is, it's, it's important to say it's not just the governor. Our colleague Eli Sherman reported roughly 70 social services agencies have yeah. written to state leaders pleading, it's, when you read the letter, to pony up money now. They say they're facing a staffing yeah. crisis. Yeah. What do you, governor aside, what do you say to those people? Yeah, I think we worked in the last budget to provide provider rate increases for exactly this reason. I think what they're writing is saying, hey, it's not enough. The pressures that we're seeing in the labor market uh, exceed what we had planned for. Um, and so we're going to be hearing from them uh, just like we are others. And so um, I mentioned we're starting with these departmental hearings, uh, but we're thinking after that we will go through and have you know, a day on health ideas, a day on education ideas, a day on you know, transportation ideas for interest groups like the groups that you mentioned to come in and prevent present to us what their ideas are, where their concerns are, what problems they're facing, and 
we're going to be looking to do that, and we'll be to Tim's point, we'll be ready to come up with our own plan if we don't have one um, by the end of the year. You, you did a nice job walking us uh, through the process. Yeah. Um, you are the Senate Finance Chair, so you have a prominent voice in this. So I'm just wondering, you know, not holding you to it, Chairman, but how. How would you like to see the money spent? Where are the state's needs yeah. right now? Yeah, I think one of the things, if you think about where all this money came from, the president calls it, calls it his Build Back Better agenda. And I think that we, as Rhode Islanders, have that same obligation, that we need to build Rhode Island back better post-pandemic as well. And so, to me, the most important thing, I've been asked this question a couple times, like, what are your biggest priorities? We have priorities, absolutely, in health care. We have priorities in housing. We have priorities in education. But the biggest priority that I have is that we invest this money. I want to be able to look back at this 10 years from now and say, you know, those investments that we made really allowed us to make a course correction, make a trajectory change for Rhode Island. What does invest mean? So that means if you think about on health care as a good example, right? In today's world, Rhode Island spends, uh, Rhode Island provides rather, about 24% of our care in home and community-based settings, whereas other states have much higher rates. So I think New Hampshire is around 74%. Those rates dramatically change the type of care and the way care is delivered to individuals, and it's also a big cost difference. We've never had the money to be able to make investments in that network or in that infrastructure to be able to offer better health care to Rhode Islanders at a lower cost, so it's a benefit to Rhode Islanders, but also, as you know, health care is a major portion of Rhode Island state budget. And if we can begin to make changes in how that care is delivered by these types of investments, we can improve care, and we can improve the state's long-term fiscal picture. So those are the kinds of investments I want us to be thinking about. And I think the first thing we need to do before we go and say we're going to spend money, what are our goals? What do we want to achieve at the end of this? What do we all want to look back on and say, this is what we were able to accomplish? we got to line up there first uh, and then begin doing the appropriations. And we don't have to spend all the money at once. You know, we can align on our goals, and if we know the first 50 million of things that we're ready to go and, and get out on the street now towards meeting those goals, then let's do it. And then if two months later we know another 100 million, we'll do that. But the important part is the planning and the time to make sure we don't just spend this money, but we invest it. What are the odds, do you think, that some amount of the money is appropriated before the end of this calendar year? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest X factor related to that is going to be, is there going to be an immediate need that is brought to us that we are made aware of, um, and there's a proposal on that we can't actually act on by the end of the year? There have been some issues that have been brought up to us, um, but there are there is already so much money out on the street, and that's why we're starting with these departmental hearings to really make sure that the money that's already out there is being utilized and is being utilized well before we start um, dipping into the more unrestricted money. Well, let's talk about that because, yeah, it's, it's, I know it's so hard for folks to keep track, but you have the, yeah. the $1.1 billion plus half a million that's, that's pretty few strings attached. The state has its pot, the locals and the districts. Then you have this other money that hasn't gotten as much attention. I watched a hearing you had, and I was surprised because the, when the administration said about $600 million of that overall $2.6 billion coming around under the Rescue Plan Act has been committed. A bunch of that is money they just, as I understood it, just sent checks off to the cities and towns, but not all of it. Yeah. And uh, one piece of it that we learned about was that this uh, ILO group contract that Tim and I and our colleagues have been reporting on actually was partly funded out of a pot that was American Rescue Plan money, which I didn't realize was being touched. Uh, did you know that before we learned about this contract? And, and, and do you have a sense of how much money has been yeah. truly spent uh, and decisions have been made? This is exactly, um, and I want to thank you guys for your reporting on this, and it helped bring our attention a bit to some of these uh, decisions that were being made in departments. And yes, that $5 million, uh, we were not aware of that it was going to be spent on that contract. And that's one of the reasons why education is going to be the first department that will be in uh, on Wednesday to talk to us about the money that they do have um, and how they're spending it. Uh, the department has tens of millions, of, my memory is right, I think around 40-something million in, in dollars that's been appropriated and they used I think about five million of it for, for that. So um, we want to get and talk to every single one of these agencies about what they've already done and what they're doing. Because the other thing that, that blends into is if there's already significant amounts of money out there for housing and it's already in the hands of the Commerce Department of Rhode Island Housing and we're hearing we need to appropriate more money now for housing, the money's already there. It's a bit of a misnomer out there. Um, that there's so much money that's not been used and so many needs that can't be met when there is so much money already out in the street. Have you been able to get, uh, I have not, been so far, a list of who has gotten, you know, we know about the ILO group contract just because mm -hmm. we've reported on it, but I, don't ha I have not been able yet to get a list of where the money has been spent yeah. so far out of ARPA. Has the committee? We have asked for that information from the administration. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we have not received it yet. 
um, but I am anticipating receiving it next week. I, just to get our viewers up to speed, ILO Group is the consulting firm that was formed the same week Governor McKee was sworn into office, and, and that was awarded the state contract worth up to $5.2 million, and it was to reopen schools, but also, Chairman, it was uh, the governor told us it was to be used for other education initiatives, uh, and he's speaking of the municip municipal education initiatives modeled after what is in your town yeah. of Cumberland. It's a mayoral-led department independent from traditional school districts. They are an alternative learning program, and I'm really doing a quick summary yeah. of it. Um, but I'm just wondering, I mean, you're in Cumberland, you live there. Has it worked yeah. there, and would you support its expansion as yeah. the governor's calling for? So the, it's called the Office of Children, Youth, and Learning uh, in Cumberland, and it was uh, founded when uh, then Mayor McKee uh, was mayor. 2007. And thank you. Uh, and uh, a year before, I was elected to the school committee uh, in Cumberland. <laughs> um, so uh, I have seen it at work, both as a school committee member and as a senator. Um, I think that they provide uh, some good after-school programming for uh, students in Cumberland, and a lot of Cumberland families do enjoy using it. I think the question has been, has it been a piece of Cumberland's academic success story? Um, and as you talk to our superintendents and our school committees, there really isn't any alignment between what they're doing at OCYL and the curriculum or any coordination to the school district. And so the model as presented, I think, certainly is a good model for, you know, after school and, you know, activity, um, whether it's an educational outcome. Um, I think is something that's a bit in question. Um, and it was something that the governor's been talking about since he became governor, and he pitched it uh, earlier this year um, as part of some of their early ideas. Um, and, you know, we basically, the legislature at the time said, you know, got more homework to do on that and come back to us. Um, so, you know, I, it certainly seems like he's trying to. I'm not sure that we would have agreed to spend, you know, that kind of money uh, heading in that direction at this point. Um, but that's going to be a conversation we'll be having with the administration in the coming months. A, a bill that is not your bill, but I do think is going through your committee, is the marijuana legislation. Mm -hmm. I know that's being negotiated by others. As far as I know, you're not one of the lead negotiators of that. But mm -hmm. uh, Senate President Ruggiero told Kim Clooney in an interview earlier this month on 12 News that he still actually is hopeful that there might be a resolution on yeah. that in the coming weeks. What, what's yeah. your sense from talking to colleagues? Senator Miller uh, and Senator McCaffrey have been taking the leadership uh, on that issue from the Senate, uh, working uh, closely with Representative Slater in the House uh, and others. They've been diligently working, uh, trying to find a way to uh, hammer out the differences between it. Um, my understanding from earlier this week is they are getting much closer. Uh, they uh, have a few remaining issues, I believe, that they're still working on. Um, so I do think there's a very real possibility that there could be an agreement on that. Um, exactly when and exactly when those things get flushed out, I'm not quite sure. Um, and it's been a bit between both the Finance Committee and the Judiciary Committee, given the, the nature of that legislation. So we're continuing to work on it. Um, you know, obviously, I've supported that. I think it makes a lot of sense for Rhode Island, uh, mostly because of the fact that you know, our neighbors are there already. Uh, we're getting all of the, you know, social impacts and cost of marijuana usage in Rhode Island, and we're not putting the money into substance abuse and treatment and other things that we could be doing if we had the revenue coming in. So I think it is something that we should move on, um, but when we're ready. So just quickly, so you've got the conversation we just had about the ARPA money, mm -hmm. the marijuana bill, you all sound more hopeful than you were some weeks ago about yeah. that. So do you, do you still think it's quite possible there's a fall session? I think for sure, I can speak for the Senate, I think uh, there's a pretty good chance the Senate will be back. Uh, whether, well, judges. Well, yeah, whether it be for ARPA or for marijuana, because the House is coming back, or if we do receive some judicial nominees, um, I think we will be back. Um, it's really just going to depend on, I really, how the next 30 or 60 days go and how much progress we're able to make and, and what agreements we can, we can reach. Have you come to a decision yet if you're going to run for general treasurer? No decision yet. Um, I think the general treasurer's office is one that um, can be a big state office holder contributing to that Build Back Better uh, agenda that I mentioned for Rhode Island. Um, I continue to take it very seriously and look at it, and I'm trying to make a decision by the end of the year, but haven't made a decision yet. By the end of the calendar year is when you're going to decide. You're going to endorse for governor? I'm not going to do that for now. Uh, I think that we're going to have a lot <laughs> Blood of... Bloodbath in your party right. we're looking at. We're gonna There's have only a, like 65 Democrats running for I governor we'll right now. I a couple more. Um, <laughs> but uh, listen, we're going to have some great candidates on the Democratic side. I'm excited uh, for them to share their ideas. Are you and, worried, though? We're, a lot of people are starting to say, hey, if the Democrats beat each other up for a whole mm -hmm. year, the Republicans are going to have this opening yeah. next fall. You live in a swing kind of... Your district's a swing. I always think you're going to lose uh, going into the election because <laughs> you have a swing district. Um, you know, are you concerned as someone who, who has voters who, who can go either way? Yeah. An election. Yeah, listen, I think it is incumbent upon all of the candidates running for governor to uh, present their ideas and, you know, obviously try to keep the inner party 
uh, friction down as much as possible. But this happens with every election. Uh, at the end of the day, the party has to sort of rebuild itself, come back together. Um, and I think it's going to be on the eventual Democratic nominee to, to really make sure that they can get a message across um, that gets them across, uh, over the finish line. Senate Finance Chairman Ryan Pearson, good to have you on the program. Thanks, Thanks so for, for joining me. us. When we Thank come you. back, we'll talk about how cozy the Democratic <laughs> race for governor is getting. And Ted and I will break down the week in news. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Uh, Ted, before we get into the crowded governor's race that we teased on the first half, I just I want to break down quickly uh, comments from the Senate Finance Chairman, Ryan Pearson. We were talking about the ARPA funds, uh, and there was so much money flying around yeah. in the first half of the show. But really, we're talking <laughs> we about getting that. some of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said $1.1 billion. He said $1.2 billion. But anyway. I believe uh, it's one point one. And then a number, and then a number that I round, that rounds it, up, it rounds down. I think I say 1.1. 1. 1, so I think you. So were you're right. saying the Senate Finance Chairman is wrong. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> got that. But the one thing that my takeaway from his answer on that, we started the conversation with the governor has expressed some frustration about the money not being spent, and 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 sort of said like you know, kind of waiting on the General Assembly. Those are my words, not him, his. Uh, and then you heard from the chairman there say that. Look, on Wednesday, we're going to start our own process mm -hmm. here, and we're going to st start moving forward on, on really exploring areas in which we can and cannot use the money. Does that say to you at all that there might be sort of a division? Uh, they're separating between the governor and the General Assembly and how that money should be spent? Yeah, you, you have two tr it sounds like you have a couple tracks here because you, as he ha Pearson, I'd say, has been particularly vocal about the fact that don't just talk about the $1.1 billion. This bill is sending $2.6 billion to Rhode Island. That's just one big pot where they have a lot of flexibility. What's going on with all that other money that's yeah. coming in? And the, He's going to hold hearings And the ILO on group clearly raised that issue a bit more in the assembly, saying, what else is being done with money we don't realize out of mm -hmm. American Rescue Plan funds? But I will say, uh, it's interesting to hear how much is clearly still uh, p potential for them to come back by the end of the year, both on the ARPA funds and on marijuana, uh, when you listen to Chairman Pearson. Now, I think the Senate is maybe more inclined to come back than the House, so he may have been speaking for his chamber, which would like to do something more. But that was interesting. It'll be, be something to watch, as he said, next 30 to 60 days. And coming up on Monday on 12 News, starting at 5 o'clock, Ted is going to have a special report looking at how some communities are spending their ARPA money. We've been talking a lot about the state money. Cities and towns and school districts are also getting a chunk of that money. So he's uh, exploring some of that on Monday. Look forward to that report. All right, let's talk about politics and the governor's race in 2022. I cannot blame people if they can't keep up already, and it's only <laughs> right. 2021. Quick sum up, Mayor Lorza dropped out of the race. Uh, Treasurer Magaziner announced, uh, as did former Secretary of State Matt Brown, uh, I want to talk specifically about Brown, but broadly the race itself. The Democratic ticket is up to four announced, including Dr. Luis Daniel Munoz and Secretary of State Nelly Gorbea. We are all assuming uh, McKee will announce, so that puts it up to five, and you're hearing about a potential six candidate. <laughs> <laughs> That's a packed ballot. Uh, any idea on how that, who that helps, who that hurts? I, you know, I, I have some humility, especially after all the surprises we've all seen in elections the past few years, right? So I, uh, I think we need to see more about how these campaigns ramp up, where the voters are come next calendar year. But certainly, if you have five candidates in the race, and you go to six if Helena Folks, who you alluded to, the former CVS executive, were to get in. First and foremost, just getting oxygen is hard for each mm. candidate. How do you get attention? There's six people vying for that. The governor will never struggle to get oxygen, Governor McKee, because he's the sitting governor. So that could be an advantage for him. His voice will kind of rise above the fray doing his work day to day to reach out to the voters. Um, but for the others, I think it, it could become more and more of a scramble because you don't need that many votes to win a primary that's going to five, with five or six candidates yeah. if all of them are somewhat competitive. But it's also so early. We've seen before, Tim, uh, in 2010, Elizabeth Roberts uh, dropped out of the race yep. when she decided her fundraising wasn't keeping up. Patrick Lynch dropped out in the summer before the primary after going for a long way. So, so much can change Including between now. a debate with, on Channel 12. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, he debated. You did that debate. Exactly. Yeah. So, so much can change that I, I think you just see it's going to be a very confusing landscape, I think, for a bit of time. And you brought it up with Chairman Pearson, uh, so I want you to weigh in on it as well. We, you know, no one from the Republican side has officially announced uh, uh, that they're going to run for governor. But if 
uh, 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 we expect a Republican will announce. If it's just one candidate there, a lot of FCR, I know. But um, if the Democrats in the primary are beating themselves up and maybe a lot of negative uh, advertising and you have a Republican candidate who can do positive messaging to try and get their name recognition up there, could this be actually beneficial to a Republican candidate? You know, certainly 20 years ago we'd have had no doubt right? Because uh, we'd seen Republicans consistently winning the governor's office very frequently in the yeah. 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. I still tend to think that there will be a significant opportunity if the Democratic Party uh, primary is a mess, if uh, someone comes out of it either damaged or having had to take positions that maybe don't play well with the broader electorate. But on the other hand, I will say it's, it's not, you know, Link Almond ran in a very different era in the 1990s, Don Kachiri in the early 2000s, in an era of Donald Trump, of polarization, of, um, you know, you see what's happening to Glenn Youngkin down in Virginia right now, who's trying desperately to find a way to keep uh, the core Republican base that loves President Trump there while appealing to moderates who, who were turned off by Trump. That's even more so in a, in a heavily blue state like Rhode Island. So that's the question. And of course, more than anything, you have to have an appealing candidate. And the right. Republicans, you know, Sue Sienke, the GOP chair, says frequently they're going to have one. Uh, they're going to have a good candidate, someone people like. But you need, you need to see that name and if they can put a campaign together. Yeah, and, and if there's a Republican primary as well, we've seen that's it another question. Ken Block and Alan Fung and how they had to go to the right to get the primary voters and then try yeah. and come back for the general uh, You could argue recent election. primary elections have done more damage to the Republicans than the Democrats, even though both sides have been contested. Alan Fung, for example, took positions on right to work in 2014 that turned labor off, even though labor wasn't happy with Gina Raimondo. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, there's, it goes back to, Tim, it's, it's fall of the year before so much can happen, but the, but the landscape is being set. Real quick, I, I said I wanted to ask you specifically about Mount, Matt Brown. His announcement was interesting to me. It wasn't just about running for governor. It seems he wants to overhaul the state house. Yeah, Matt Brown is, you know, he's talking about basically leading a revolution um, in Rhode Island government uh, that throws out the entire establishment, not just elect a governor and a lieutenant governor, because he's running with East Providence Senator Cynthia Mendes as a sort of a ticket. Um, but he wants to have candidates up and down the ballot. They're, they're challenging staunch progressives like Don Oyer, the state senator Newport, yeah, who chairs the Environment me. Committee, it surprised a lot of people. But they say anyone who has gotten along with the current statehouse leadership uh, should be tossed out if, effectively, um, or at least most of, most anybody. So I think that, you know, that both could make Matt Brown stand out as someone saying not just tinkering around the edges, I'm going to, I want to blow up Rhode Island. But of course, that could also scare some voters who maybe aren't looking for that level of radical change. And we don't know necessarily, you know, round primary electorates generally skew older, even in the Democratic mm. Party. So how much will there be an appetite for that kind of really staunch left wing message? Um, but we know there is some appetite for it. We've seen it in other places. All right. Running out of time, but I do want to touch on this. And I, I should point out that we, we we're taping this on a Thursday afternoon. And so many of our loyal viewers are watching this on a, on a Sunday. Things in Washington are going to change, but there's this internal fight with Democrats with the one $1 trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure bill and then the three point five trillion dollar budget reconciliation bill. Progressives in the House don't want to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill until the three point five trillion dollar bill goes. Anyway, a lot you know, of numbers on newsmakers, it, it, yeah, <laughs> and I apologize, but you know this is again an internal battle that I'm sure the Republicans just enjoy watching right now. You have said to me that a lot of this was baked in the cake on election night. Uh, yeah, I do think that's true, Tim. I mean, in the end, the Senate, the U.S. Senate, uh, any senator can have a veto in the U.S. Senate. You need... Because the margin uh, is so thin. Yeah, the Democrats have exactly 50 votes, and the vice president can break a tie in their favor. Uh, and in the House, Nancy Pelosi has just a couple votes, too. And, you know, the Democrats underperformed. A lot of people thought the polls seemed to show that they were going to have a strong year in 2020. And yes, they kept their majorities, and Joe Biden won the presidency. But Donald Trump well outperformed expectations, mm -hmm. even though he lost. And that left the Democrats with, as you said, razor-thin majorities, and yet they're putting forward a very ambitious, sweeping uh, plan in that $3.5 trillion budget bill, which I know a lot of Democrats love most of what's in it, but clearly not every Democrat agrees with every line, and you need basically every Democrat in agreement here because they have no margin for error. I mean, the, for the progressives who are upset, the answer was really win more Senate seats, but that's already baked in the cake, and now they're seeing the effects of that. Well, win more Senate seats, all of this is playing out as we're going into the midterm elections. Do you think this could 
negatively impact, this sort of infighting negatively impact Democrats going into midterms? I've certainly heard the mood shift among Democrats, I'd say, over the summer from cautious optimism, maybe they wouldn't have too bad of a uh, midterm to you know, uh-oh, well, between Afghanistan, the border crisis, as you've mentioned, and also what well, we're seeing now. Well, that has to do more with President Biden, right? Because, you know, midterms exactly. are a referendum on the president, and things aren't going great yeah. right now. For and him. right now, you know, that bipartisan infrastructure bill was supposed to be kind of a, a, moment. a moment for yeah. Biden to say, yeah. look, I can get deals done in a polarized right. Washington. And instead, you know, it's getting beaten up quite a bit by the left side of his party and kind of held hostage to this other bill. So, but on the other hand, you know what? Voters can sometimes have short memories. If the bills pass and they're popular and things calm down, maybe Biden's numbers improve. But I certainly think Democrats are more worried than they were in May. Yeah, well, and we, we are talking about this like the election <laughs> is next month. If you missed any of the newsmakers, it's on WPRI.com. Don't forget to check out Ted's special report Monday at 5 o'clock. I'm Tim White. That's Ted Nisi. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.